All right, hi everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar. Um, so my name is Harry Mameski. I am the faculty director of the program for financial studies at Columbia Business School. Uh, with me is Melina Denebein, who co-directs the, the PFS with, uh, with me. And we're very excited, uh, I truly mean that, uh, to have Alkesh Shah here with us uh, to talk about the crypto space and digital assets uh, more broadly. So Alkesh is a managing director and the head of the global crypto and digital asset strategy at Bank of America Global Research. And he really has a storied career on Wall Street having covered the technology sector for some time. So we won't find really a, a bigger expert than Alkesh in this space uh, to talk to us about crypto and, and digital assets. We're very excited. Uh, as are, are you judging by the attendance at this webinar, I think actually there's a lot of excitement to have Alkesh here with us. So, um, so we're gonna talk about cryptocurrencies and digital assets. Um, this new and uh, quickly growing area of the economy generates many, many strong opinions. To quote the legendary investor, Charlie Munger from a CBS interview, Charlie said, Bitcoin is worthless artificial gold, which if it succeeds would elicit a lot of illegal activity. Now that is something I think the world does not need. That's Charlie. On, on the other hand, you have Mark Andreessen, the equally legendary coder and venture capitalist, who says, I compare it to the internet. It's like 93, 94. Actually, he said this in 2014. So I guess by now it's like 99, 2000. The internet was a new way to transmit data. And Bitcoin, he says, is a new way to transmit money. And it's going to take time. He said 20 years, I think, to catch on. But you know, obviously he's very bullish in this space. So one of the problems in talking about crypto and digital assets is that one, um, the technology is very hard and many people don't really understand it, it's complicated. And, and the space is doing so many things, not the least of which is attempting to transform the entire financial system. It's a lot to wrap your head around. You know, and three, everything is changing so quickly that it's really hard to keep track of all the new developments in the space. So. In the next hour and a half or so, hour 25 minutes, we're gonna figure it all out. So you're gonna leave here knowing everything there is to know. And uh, for that, you can thank Alkesh. So I'm gonna, the way we're gonna do the rest of our talk is, Alkesh is gonna, I'm gonna hand it over to him. He's gonna talk um, about the space. Then, we'll, then he and I will have a little bit of a discussion, maybe 15 minutes of Q and A. And then we're gonna open up to the audience. We have a lot of people, we'll have a lot of questions and have some, you know, give Alkesh a chance to respond to all of your questions. So with that, uh, for me, I'm going to hand it over to Alkesh. Thank you for being here with us. And the floor, or the virtual floor is all yours. Great. Well, thank you, Harry. And thank you, Melina, for inviting me and letting me participate here. Um, just a little bit more context on my background. You know, Harry gave uh, a, a pretty full view, and thank you. Uh, so I've been uh, on the sell side uh, of banking for about 25 years. Um, my first year out of business school, I was able to be part of the Netscape IPO, so the first internet IPO. I was an author of the very first internet report on Wall Street, which came out for Morgan Stanley, um, very low on the list <laughs> because I was junior, uh, but, but, I, but my name was there. Um, and so really I've watched the internet evolve from Mark Andreessen's you know, initial vision as um, one of the creators of Netscape, which is the browser that really launched web 1.0 and brought the internet to the consumer. Um, and you know, watched how it evolved into where we are today, web 2.0. And you know, one of the things, and we're not going to get into it deeply uh, in this discussion, uh, unless it comes up in Q and A, is you know, you're hearing more and more about the metaverse as well, and that's the other thing that's getting people excited is that really digital assets, not Bitcoin specifically, but digital assets, which are you know a really different way of using software code that has ever been done before, uh, and which, by the way, Charlie Munger didn't understand when he made those statements, so I forgive him, uh, is that as digital assets have evolved, they will be the bridge between the real world and the virtual world. And there will be no metaverse without digital assets. And so you'll have tokenized land, you'll have potential you know, ways to do payments, to buy things in the metaverse. All of that needs digital assets. Again, it doesn't have to be Bitcoin. 
And by the way, we're already moving to the world of digital currencies, right? You know, once upon a time, people traded rocks, then they went to salt, they used gold for a while, we've given up on that. Now we just, you know, trust the government. Um, some don't, but most of us do. And, you know, we think we're digital today with our currency. We're not, we're electronic. We always need a middleman. Once there's digital, you don't need the middleman. You can actually use it like cash. I can give, you know, Harry some money, smartphone to smartphone. And that's the promise of digital. We're not there yet, despite what Gary Gensler said this afternoon that, you know, the dollar's array digital, who is probably the, has the best understanding of digital assets, but we're getting there and we will be getting there with digital assets and with probably the Fed one day putting out an actual digital currency. So with that, let me actually just share some of my slides. Again, if I can get this to work. There we go. Harry, how's that look? Great. Okay, so just to give uh, you know folks a sense, I've been in research for probably um, you know eighteen years of uh, my career. Uh, the last few years, I actually pretty much worked for a living, meaning I actually made something. But as a researcher, you're an advisor. You're you know somewhat of a consultant. Uh, investment advisor. Um, last few years, I actually created a mobile app and a web portal. Um, succeeded, has lots of usage, people are doing it, but you know, that, that was enough for me. I had to go back to being an advisor in research. Uh, and um, I've had an interest in the crypto and digital asset world for a number of years. Uh, and I guess I was too vocal within B of A. Um, so therefore they said, well, then you should cover it as a strategist. And that's how I got this role which um, you know, started over the summer. We launched coverage just seven weeks ago. And um, as you may imagine, the interest has been high. <laughs> so you know, I remember actually reading this article back in 2000 <laughs> and having clients send it to me. Um, by the way, clients, you know, some clients had to buy an email attachment usually through AOL. Uh, some of them actually faxed it to me back in 2000. So, um, you know, I still get that today as well on digital assets, just as I got it in the 90s, where people were saying the internet really isn't going to be anything real. It's just a fad. Gary Gensler, who's now, you know, the CHC chair, uh, taught a course on digital assets. I mean, he accepts that this is going to be transformative. And I, and I agree. And hopefully... You know, by the time uh, we get through this presentation and go through the Q and A, you'll agree that this is something that's not going away, and it's something that's actually going to change not only the financial industry and why it's so hard to keep up with it. It's going to change every industry. It's going to make industries more efficient. It's going to bring more transparency to every industry. And again, all of this can be done without Bitcoin. It can be done with the way the software is used, and that's the biggest challenge I've had since launching is most people I talk to start and pretty much end with the idea this is just Bitcoin. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about Ethereum uh, through this presentation because that's really how this ecosystem has evolved away from Bitcoin. And this is what really will change every industry is that Ethereum was created as a piece of software almost against Bitcoin in that Bitcoin was very specialized, Ethereum was generalized. And I'm gonna talk about what that means, but that's a really important point that I'd like people to take away. So let me give you some stats. Right now, the entire ecosystem is worth about $3 trillion. You know, you wonder why people care, you don't have to wonder. $3 trillion is a big reason for people to care. Today, we have about now, actually about 230 million crypto users. You know, I created this slide about uh, two and a half weeks ago and it's growing. Um, but of that $3 trillion ecosystem, only about a trillion dollars of it is Bitcoin. But that's amazing, right? Because in 2010, the value, overall value of those 19 million Bitcoins was zero. So in 10 years, you've gone to a trillion. Anybody who ignores that has a problem <laughs> because you have to explain why you're not involved, or if you're not involved, that's okay. 
but you have to have a really good reason for why you're not involved when you've missed a trillion dollar asset. On the other side of it is outside of Bitcoin, there's these different coins that really are acting like operating systems and creating ecosystems. And what I mean by an ecosystem is these other coins or blockchains are created so that you can create applications on top of them. And there are hundreds of applications. And in some cases, thousands of applications being built on top, just the way there are applications built on Windows, there's applications built on Mac OS. And the reason why that extra one and a half trillion dollars, which has really only arrived over the last three years and why everybody is paying attention to this sector is because of these ecosystems that are being created. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as well. So right now there's also out of these applications, there, some of them are being used and they're being used uh, in financial applications that actually Harry mentioned at the beginning. And there's about $250 billion already being used. Imagine that as like a bank having a reserve of $250 billion so that they could do lending, they could do credit, all of those things. So there's $250 billion already. And it really only started about 18 to 24 months ago. So again, something that to really pay attention to. And then I want to talk a little bit about stable coins. This is really re the reason why all the governments are talking about regulation here is when Facebook talked about their vision of Libra as a stable coin a few years ago, most central banks had had you know, some pet projects going on about digital currencies, but suddenly it became apparent that Facebook with 3 billion users globally may be able to bypass the fiat currencies of countries by pegging Libra to a global basket, it would take away the monetary policy power of some of the governments or at least mitigate it or diminish it. And that became a real concern and there is no more Libra. <laughs> that the governments are pretty much around the world said not a chance. They then you know, brought that back down to DM, um, which was, a huge compromise because that was just like other stable coins that exist already. Uh, and even that, you know, pretty much is now dying out and becoming more of a wallet, um, <clears throat> which, you know, that could be interesting, the Novi wallet. But what's interesting is stable coins of that $3 trillion ecosystem are now worth 130 billion of it. That doesn't seem like a big part of the ecosystem, but you had $1.7 trillion of transactions happening in the second quarter using stable coins. That's a real number. And that's up from 200 billion the year before. So you can imagine the next year, we're gonna definitely be at a quarterly run rate of two to two and a half trillion dollars a quarter using stable coin transactions, which are used for payments, which are used really for a lot of those decentralized finance applications that there are now reserves of $250 billion. And so that's why stable coins are becoming important even though the Facebook vision of Libra has pretty much disappeared. And then finally, NFTs are really interesting, right? NFTs are something that actually everybody can really understand in that it started off as digital art. And so, okay, you know, some people pay $100 for a, a piece of artwork, you know, just because it fits the decor. Others pay, you know, $50 million because they really love that piece of art. So you can understand why somebody paid $69 million at Christie's for a piece of digital art because they wanted that unique digital art. And the beauty of the blockchain is they really, everybody knows it is their ownership. But what's really interesting is the end of power of NFTs is you can actually add, again, remember all of the stuff that I'm talking about is just software. You can add artificial intelligence to that software. You could add applications to that software. You can turn an NFT into an insurance policy. You can turn an NFT into an avatar within the metaverse. You can do so much with an NFT that this is gonna be one of the biggest areas of growth. So these are the stats that are really driving all of the attention to this sector. So let's start with tokens. So there's 14,500 tokens um, and you know today, and there's probably, I don't know, 50, maybe more being created all the time, uh, maybe every week. 
And the reason why is that it's easy to create a token. So for example, um, there's a link, there's a company that if I give them $300, they'll create an Alkesh coin. Probably won't be that much demand for the Alkesh coin. My mom will buy one, I'm sure. But outside of that, I don't know who else is gonna really buy it. So really you can easily make a token. However, there are very few of these tokens that actually can be operating systems where you can build an ecosystem on top of. And out of the 14,000 plus tokens out there, there's probably only 50 that really matter. So 50 is really the universe for investors. There's a lot of traders and collectors and that's fine. Those are all real things. Um, but out of the hundred tokens that are valued at over a billion dollars market value, half of those hundred tokens have real use cases and are building ecosystems. The other half, are more what's called meme coins. So people are just buying them because they want to identify with something. They want to, you know, play with Doge. They want to play with Shibu. You know, all, all stuff that I'm not quite sure I understand. But um, I don't really care about that part. I care about the 50 that are building ecosystems. And so, just this is going to be the only real slide on technology because if you really want to, you know, talk about blockchain. Um, we're gonna spend the next two hours doing that and everybody's gonna log off. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time deep diving on the tech, but the key is, is all of the software we use today, everything we're using was designed to be used either on a desktop, a smartphone or on a server. Nothing was designed to really be peer to peer, wallet to wallet, smartphone to smartphone. That's the promise of digital assets is you finally have software being written for that. And it doesn't have to be a blockchain operating on 100,000 nodes. It could be a blockchain or a distributed ledger that really just is working on 20 nodes. So for example, for supply chain, you could have just a supply chain from, as Microsoft did, from a, the semi foundry into the Xbox. It only needed eight nodes. And they were able to save tens of millions of dollars through efficiency because they could use blockchain technology because all the current programs and software are siloed, right? Every company has their own version of the software. They don't interoperate. You could probably have somebody sitting with an Excel file somewhere trying to keep track of all this and fail. And by using blockchain and on a small basis, not the pure vision of, everybody having it, they were able to save tens of million dollars and make themselves more efficient. And that's why blockchain is important. Okay, I'm leaving tech, deep tech now and going to, you know, where are we and how did we get here? So I had mentioned that in 2010, pretty much none of this existed. Uh, so all $3 trillion of value has arrived really over the last 10 years. But you can see that that value really began growing in 2016 and 2017. So you had a couple of things happening along the way. You had Bitcoin starting to get a little bit more adopted. You had you know, the ability for institutions to get involved with futures trading, which really happened in 2018. But in 2015, when Vitalik actually created Ether and wrote the, with a team, by the way, uh, wrote the Ethereum uh, software and added the ability to have executable files. That's what a smart contract is. It's an executable file. You could actually create applications on top of this. That's what got this entire ecosystem going. So you had Bitcoin contributing one of the three trillion and you had Ether, which became so wildly successful that that entire operating system became congested. And the way to think of that, and this happened really early last year is, you know, if you have too many applications open on your computer, the computer slows down, right? And so that's what's happened to Ether is that so, so it was so much more successful than anybody expected. It has gotten congested, it's gotten slower. And the beauty though of these operating systems, and you might wonder why Ether now is worth half a trillion dollars of the alternative coin. So Bitcoin's a trillion, Ether's half a trillion is, 
that because it's an ether isn't owned by one company. So remember, I've been using this operating system analogy. So when Microsoft had DOS or Windows, they owned the software, right? So they could charge a company that wanted to build an application, a licensing fee for the developer tools, the kits. Uh, if a desktop wanted to use the operating system once upon a time, they were able to charge for that as well. And so with Ether, because the owners are the people who own the coins, they actually charge a transaction fee for those applications that are built on top of this operating system. So this way, everybody benefits. But since they didn't expect it to be so popular, they built it with an Uber type payment thing. So in other words, when the congestion rises, the transaction fee goes up. And so now that people are building NFTs on Ether, people are doing you know, all sorts of different applications like that $250 billion of financial applications, you could be trying to create a $25 Axie NFT avatar and it could end up costing you $100 because the network was congested at that time. So therefore you've now had other tokens be created. That's why there's 50 is because Solana, Cardano, Tezos, these have had a window of opportunity because Ether right now has just done so well that people need alternatives because sometimes it can be too expensive. But again, this is software. And again, if you stick with me with the operating system idea, remember we don't use the windows that was used in you know, 1997. Today we're up to Windows 11. Same thing is happening with these tokens where they actually are evolving. And there is definitely a roadmap for Ether to become less congested, charge less, move faster. Um, and so ultimately we think there will be you know, a number of tokens, but I doubt five or 10 years from now, even the 50 that I'm looking at out of the 14,000 plus will survive. I don't know if it'll be down 90%, if it'll be down 70%, <clears throat> if they'll become specialized, I don't know. But there's not gonna be 50 generalized operating systems 10 years from now. And that's something to really keep in mind because again, I lived through the internet uh, being created as well as through its evolution. And I can tell you that in 1998, one out of four internet companies are the blue chips of today. Three out of four of those companies are out of business. So, you know, there's a huge promise for this ecosystem. It absolutely isn't going away. It's absolutely critical that everybody understand it because you're going to live it for the next 20 years and for the rest of your lives. But at the same time, you have to be really careful because we're so early that there's going to be a lot of winners, but there's going to be a lot of losers. I think based on where we are with VC funding and so on, we're probably around 1997 for the internet. Now, this moves really fast, maybe 97 to 2000 gets compressed, uh, or maybe it doesn't. So either way, my take is we're in the early innings here and we're probably around 1997 if we're compared to the internet. So here's the other reason why people are really focused on this space. The beginning of the year, the entire ecosystem was worth $800 billion. And today it's worth $3 trillion. A lot of this has to do with Bitcoin adoption, as well as with these alternative assets that are becoming operating systems, because people are finally seeing the promise of what this can do, and especially of what's happening with NFTs. So this is the other reason why everybody has to pay attention. Quick technology note again, just to remind everybody, just because one of the other ways to play this area is I get a lot of times, well, okay, you know, so I have to buy Ether or I have to buy Solana. Um, you don't have to buy anything. I'm, I'm not advising. I have no investment recommendations here. And there's a little blurb at the bottom saying there's no investment recommendations. But what I will say is there are picks and shovels for this industry as well, right? So you have to use semiconductors to actually make the tokens or mint the tokens or mine the tokens. 
you need hard drive space, storage space for all of the ledger and transactions. If the metaverse really happens, the amount of cloud data center activity is gonna be massive. So you need energy companies. And we've written actually a couple of notes where now that there are utilities in the US that have excess power, they're actually working with mining companies to provide power at low demand times. These companies are actually now helping to balance the grid. They're actually pulling energy from renewable utilities. And so those are all also plays in this space. At the same time, on the right, you can see a number of private companies that are up and coming. And to put private companies into perspective, over the next three years, you're gonna have a lot of public options in this space to invest in. The reason why I think that is that this year alone, $20 billion of VC funding is going into this space. That's up from $3 billion last year. And I think it's gonna be higher next year based on the VC funds that are accumulating money to invest in these private companies. And as I mentioned, there's hundreds, if not thousands of applications being built on these ecosystems. Again, many of them aren't gonna make it, but all of these are asking for you know, a certain amount of funding. And you're gonna start seeing people come into the public markets. It's gonna require work. Everybody has to do their homework themselves to figure out is this gonna be Amazon or pets.com. But, and you know, for our clients, we're creating an investment framework to try to understand that so that they can invest there. But that's what's really critical here. And here are some of the companies that are, you know, really up and coming. Almost all of these have a private uh, value of um, over a billion dollars. So they're almost all unicorns. I'm now having to start calling things dragons. That's for those that, you know, don't know, I didn't know, are uh, private companies that have a valuation of over $10 billion. Um, these guys are gonna, you know, one day be available to us in the public markets as well. So, and this is only, uh, you know, a, a small list of the companies, but these are the unicorns and dragons that are already existing today. <coughs> you also have corporates on their earnings calls talking more and more about digital assets. That's another driver. And what I'm hearing is a number of the boards are asking their corporate management teams to discuss digital assets in their quarterly board presentations. Doesn't mean they're telling their, you know, their CEOs and CFOs that they have to put digital assets on the balance sheet or anything like that. It's they wanna understand what the thinking is long-term of what CFOs, CEOs, treasurers are thinking about. And if they're saying they have no interest in it, they have to have a reason. And that's creating, you know, again, more interest in the space. At the same time, companies are getting it, mainly tech and financial companies, but they're hiring. So, you know, for, you know, the people on the call that are looking for a job, this is a good area. There's a lot of um, hiring going on in the space, and I think there will be more. Um, and you can see, you know, this is actually uh, pretty, this is from April. We're actually running a quant group that um, within research at P of A, uh, where we're gonna update this quarterly. And you know, recent numbers just continue to grow. At the same time, institutions are getting into this area. They're still very small, but they're growing in terms of users and they're growing in terms of transactions, transaction amounts. That's what tells you that it's institutional versus individual. And you know, here's the final reason why everybody still talks about Bitcoin, right? Is that it's you know, a dollar in 2009 is $80 million today. The first purchase that happened in 2010 uh, for two pizzas in today's dollars would be $600 million of Bitcoin for those two pizzas. Um, it's a reason why people care. It's also because it's now become the ninth largest asset in the world, but you know, there's other assets that are still valued higher and it is the best performing asset this year. So if you look though on the lower, lower uh, graph, Altcoins though are arriving as well. And that's, if you see right now, they're very correlated. However, over the last few weeks, they've become, become begun to decouple um, as Bitcoin continues with its supply demand dynamic. 
but we're hearing more and more about these alternative coins having more and more of an ecosystem type of value. And so here are the top 10 coins by value. You can see Bitcoin still at a trillion, Ether at half a trillion, but these other coins are slowly growing. There's in the tens of billions, you'll probably see them, some of them, again, we don't make recommendations on specific tokens, but some of these could be above hundred billion. At the same time, I look at Dogecoin that has no use case. I have no idea why it's 36 billion. I have no explanation. Doesn't mean it can't be. People want to own it, they can, but um, no explanation there. We are also seeing for these alternative coins, more and more individual interests. So it's not just institutions getting the ecosystem idea. It's people that really want to get involved in this market that are now looking at Ether and Solana and Polkadot. And the other analysis we're doing is actually looking, comparing that to mentions. And so we can actually catch meme coins as well. So Shibu, which, you know, really took off which again has no operating system real capabilities, which is smart contract capability, um, had the most mentions, had the most market value change. Here's another way we're looking at activity. And this is really an important piece because what this tells you is, is an ecosystem being created on a token. And now here's a reminder again, the blockchain is completely open and transparent, right? So. If you have the quant tools, you have to create the quant tools, you can actually see developer activity. You can see transaction activity as a proxy for user adoption. And over time, as the ecosystems mature, we're nowhere near that yet, you may be able to even forecast transaction fees, which I'm a fundamental analyst guy, being 25 years into this, I would love to do a DCF on this. It hurts me a little bit every time I talk about just supply demand. But one day I, I see it out there. Um, hopefully, you know, I make it through. Uh, but this is really the way an investment framework is going to be built around this. And it's not just going to be a supply demand type commodity. And it's not just the ones that people are really thinking about, which are the top 10 in market value. <clears throat> there are others, as you can see here, where you actually have smaller token values that have created specific use cases. So for example, Tezos, which is seeing a lot of developer activity is marketed as a really fast and private type token, which is drawing in developers. And that's really interesting as well as some of these others are really drawing in developers. And so the battle is really 1997. We're nowhere near knowing who the Amazon and the Google and Facebooks are yet, but they probably exist today. And so for the people who do their homework, you know, there is a chance to find them. My view is, is a portfolio approach that's diversified is better than picking just one, because I think it's really hard to just pick one yet, despite the investment framework we're building around this. This is what I meant by on-chain analytics. We are using quant tools and actually analyzing the blockchain to see where money's going in, where developer activity is happening, where <clears throat> payments that are being used for cross-border, how that's going with wallets. And so you can actually do this work. And this is another reason why, you know, there's this view, there's a lot of illicit activity going on. And yet the data that we see is that at least for illicit wallet use, it's probably less than half of 1% of transactions. And the reason for that is because you can track the wallets. You can, if somebody steals money and transfers the crypto to a wallet, the law enforcement guys can actually track the wallets. So there's companies like Chainalysis, like Elliptic. Um, there's a company called CypherTrace that MasterCard just bought uh, because that's what they can do. So criminals really can't get away with large amounts of money. Maybe with small amounts, it's not worth the FBI's time to go after them and maybe they can get to a wallet that they could. But you know, when you had, for example, the Colonial Pipeline, they tracked it, they caught them, they found the wallet. When you had um, a hacker just for fun, uh, you know, hack some money from uh, an exchange, really once it was in that hacker's wallet, 
they knew where the wallet was. They knew who had, they knew the money using social media. They could probably figure out who that person was and they gave it back. So it's really hard on the blockchain to do significant illicit activity. And especially if the regulatory framework shifts the way we expect it to, where our view is the regulators will ultimately make wallets into bank accounts with all of the AML, KYC, know your client uh, and whitelist wallets that really, where you really know who the wallet own, is owned by. We really do expect that as part of the regulatory framework that's likely in the near to intermediate term. So just quickly as to how, remember I had mentioned the money that's being reserved for these new financial applications. You can see it really started this year. And it started because the smart contract capability was brought in 2015. The applications began to be written in 2017, 2018, 2019. Usage began in 2020. This has nothing to do with a bubble. This has nothing to do with excess liquidity. This has to do with the fact that there are applications that people can use that instead of making a settlement in two days or five days, if I'm spending sending $300 to India, it happens real time while I'm still on the phone with my family. And instead of costing me $10, it's free. That's the reason why these applications are taking off. NFTs, here's something fun. So as I've mentioned, what really got people excited, and by the way, NFTs have been around for a while. I know most people have only really heard about them this year. You know, in 2018, there really was only one set of NFTs that anybody talked about. There were other NFTs there too, but in 2018, it was CryptoKitties. You could buy a CryptoKitty. Your CryptoKitty would, you know, slow, you know, would grow or may not grow depending on the CryptoKitty you bought. And, and that was it. So it was almost a joke of the digital asset world. But then in March, when, you know, the artist people created that NFT that got sold through Christie's for $69 million, Suddenly people you know, paid attention, $69 million is real money. And so suddenly you had celebrities get into this, you had, of course, individuals get into it, you had sports teams get into it. And you can see how it all has happened this year. And pretty much everybody has an NFT now, right? Martha Stewart has an NFT, every sports team is talking about an NFT, every you know, movie studio is thinking about NFTs for all of their characters as avatars. Um, you know, the new Spider-Man limited edition NFT that's coming out for the Spider-Man movie this weekend uh, crashed AMC servers, but people bought tickets because they were hoping to get in the lottery for, you know, one of the collectible NFTs. Um, and so NFTs have become super hot. Um, I think I'm not positive how much everybody who's buying these NFTs really know what they are and what they're getting, but there are really interesting use cases if you're not just buying an NFT for the sake of, you know, uh, you just heard some celebrity say they like it. And I'll give you an example of a use case or a couple of use cases. So for example, an NFT can create a recurring revenue stream. So what I could do is say I'm a photographer. I, um, I'm just starting out. So I take this great picture, right? Um, and I know that if I post it, um, people can copy it, they can download it. I mean, th there's some software to prevent that, but you know, somebody's gonna get that picture. So what I do is I create an NFT ownership of that picture and I give them access to the raw file. So that's the you know, complete raw uh, pixels, which is usually a very big file that um, I played with. But since I'm just starting out, I sell the ownership of that raw file and of the photo for $100. I can add a smart contract to that NFT so that when I'm more famous, which of course I'll be, um, and that person sells it for $1,000, 10% of that sale comes back to me and so on and so on and so on. Or think of it another way, you know, People are going to concerts, buy these tickets, and immediately the person buying the ticket resells it. You could do virtual tickets the way we have for the last year, using an NFT, add a smart contract, and at least the creator 
of the event will get paid every time that NFT sells. So you can create a recurring revenue stream or royalty stream from that. You can do the same thing with an avatar uh, that's used. And so that's a, you know, a really cool way to use NFTs because this is software. Another use case is insurance policies. So say I'm a farmer, uh, I usually buy an insurance policy <coughs> against the weather uh, in case something goes wrong. You can have an insurance company create a very simple NFT once, not have to go through all of the contracts ever again with just the variables of the coordinates of the land that's being used, and then the weather conditions, maybe a temperature range, maybe a rainfall range. And once that's set, the variables can change depending on you know, who they sell the policy to. But if anything happens outside that range, the policy pays. You don't need an insurance adjuster. The farmer knows what they're getting. And so you've shrunk the cost for the insurance company. And if insurance companies don't do this, you know there's gonna be startup insurance companies that do. And you've made it really easy and the farmer doesn't have to trust the insurance company. This is part of why they call this, this software trust less is you don't have to trust an intermediary. The software is doing the work for you. So I've covered a lot of things. There's just a couple more and then I'm going to go to Q&A. So these are the other types of tokens that are there. And as I mentioned, stable coins have gotten really, really interesting because of the transactions and what's causing the digital currency by the central banks um, in terms of focus and why the regulations are coming. So our view is that stable coins really are going to be regulated first and they will likely be regulated as some sort of money market instrument. The companies creating the stable coins will probably be regulated as banks. And so you're going to see a major change there. You're going to see the financial applications being used on digital assets probably need a lot more consumer protection. And so a lot more disclosure, a lot more auditing, maybe more reserves. And all of that's going to be coming probably over the next one to two to three years. Uh, I think sooner rather than later, it's happening. For those that think there's a lot of Bitcoin regulations, I don't really think that's going to happen. My sense is, is Regulators understand Bitcoin. It's not really being used as payments. It's not really being used for these financial applications. It is something that people are using right now as a store of value, although it's acting recently still as a risk asset. Um, but you know, I, I don't think there's going to be a lot messing with it. It's that new two trillion dollars of value that's been created in the last three years, where people are going to pay more attention. And you know, here's some of the market you know, some metrics around stable coins. And then wanted to just touch on central bank digital currencies, because I think this is really important. And then I'm going to give you one more slide and then I'm done. So what's happening with central bank digital currencies is China is in the lead. And China's in the lead in that they have now 149 million people in China, 10% uh, of the population actually have wallets on their smartphones. They've done $6 billion of transactions as of June. Um, they intend to launch their central bank digital currency, the e yuan, uh, with the Olympics next year. And one of the reasons why they're in advance is that the US and Europe are still struggling with two big things. One, privacy. The challenge with, the, with a digital currency is that the government then sees every transaction and they can see into every wallet. So if you, even if the wallet was anonymous, you can kind of figure it out, right? You, based on who they're paying, where they live. It's sort of like the way every phone, um, cell phone provider knows really who you are. Right? They know where your bill is being paid. They know where you work. They know the restaurants you like because they're tracking you all the time because you're every three minutes pinging the closest cell tower. So they, they know everything about you. Well, in this case, the government's going to know everything about the person using the digital currency. And so the privacy issue is something that 
the US and Europe are struggling with. The second piece is <coughs> we're very successful, especially in the US with a two tier banking system. So in other words, you know, the central bank prints money, they have a balance sheet, but they pretty much are hands off. Uh, recently, they've been a little more hands on, but usually they're pretty hands off. On the other hand, the banks provide credit, they provide mortgages, they provide loans, they take deposits, they give you interest. So the two tier system works really well for us. What I think the US and the EU and the Bank of England are trying, the ECB uh, and the Bank of England are trying to figure out is what happens to deposits if there's a digital currency? Is there just an entire, a big sucking of assets into the wallet? Or maybe there's zero left in checking accounts because checking accounts generally don't make any interest anyway, and that just sits in wallets. And what does that do then to the reserves of banks? So, I mean, they'll work their way through this. This is inevitable. Uh, and it's the natural progression to a digital currency, but it's one of the reasons why China is in the lead, is they're paying a little bit less attention to those two big issues um, for whatever reasons. Um, but it's something that is holding the US back the most. It doesn't hurt that the US is also the dollars to reserve for the world, but it's also what the Bank of England and the ECB are struggling with. Uh, but even with that, um, the ECB expects to have a pilot at least within five years of their digital currency. The Bank of England expects to have a e pound by 2030. And I would think, you know, the Fed uh, will have something after that. But we're not talking next year. We're not talking five years. We're talking really 10, 15 years. So this is my last slide. I want to just let you know where I'm spending my time. Because again, if it's 1997, there's still a lot of work to do. I'm not done, despite this 150 page launch report that we wrote last month, um, because there's a lot more to do and it changes so fast that you know, we have to look at these blockchains and figure out which of them are real, which of them are getting developer activity. There's new ways for the blockchains that don't scale as fast. Like Bitcoin, I told you, was not, is an operating system with a fixed application of money. It hasn't worked as money yet, uh, but there's a scaling solution called Lightning that's software that sits on top that makes it look like a general operating system. So there's things like that that's happening. And this is coming across all of these places. And as I had mentioned, there's 60 companies already that have private valuations of over a billion dollars. And many of the com those companies, what they're doing is they're bringing the banks and the institutions and the mutual funds and the hedge funds into the digital asset world. They're helping them with how do you custody this stuff? How do you AML, KYC? How do you meet all the regulatory stuff? How do you actually figure out the taxing, taxes and accounting, all those? And then finally on the gaming side, gaming and NFTs and the metaverse is where I'm gonna be spending obviously a lot of time. I mean, if you think about, for example, you know, I'm sure some of you on the call have heard of Axie. Axie has, is a game platform, has 2 million users a day, have sold virtual assets of over two and a half billion dollars. And somebody just bought a plot of land in Axie, not to be used for gaming, but to build a lounge so that the, when people need to rest and just hang out, which is what the metaverse is about, they paid $2.4 million for that piece of virtual land. And there's people, some of you may have seen the documentary on YouTube, uh, there are people in the Philippines who are making $5 a day. They're now making NFT avatars for Axie and they're making $20 a day. They've increased their daily compensation by 4X just by making NFTs. And so this is really changing you know, so much. So with that, I will hand the screen back to Harry and Melina. Um, all right. Thanks. Okay. So um, I'm a little torn. Do, do, you, do you know everything now, Harry? You told me I had to get everything uh, clear. I, you know, I, I now feel I am more, by knowing more, I feel more confused than I was before. So I don't oh, know. No. If that that, that I do feel like I know more. So, but I, I am torn because I, I have enough questions to fill up the remaining 40 minutes. 
but also people have asked, I don't know, 50 questions. So uh, let me ask one or, or two, and then we'll hand it off to Melina and she'll sort of, she's been cataloging people's questions. So here's one question I have that's sort of a little bit of a contradiction to me. It's a little bit of a skeptical question. So like blockchain was born out, out of this like libertarian ethos of like, you know, get the central counterparty out of my business and let people transact in the blockchain. And, in, you know, in reality, so no individual accesses the blockchain and virtually no one accesses it through, you know, directly. Like people own these coins through like Coinbase or PayPal or Robinhood or all of these trusted counterparties that you have to believe are doing what they say they're doing. So like what gives here? Like, isn't this a little bit of a contradiction at the heart of the system? And can it evolve with trusted counterparties, even though the whole thing was built around not having them? So you, you've set me up to get hate mail. <laughs> um, you know, you're right. The, this is not the purity of vision of where the digital asset ecosystem is not going to where uh, Satoshi thought it would in 2009, right? Bitcoin, when it was written and the blockchain was initially created, it was done in reaction to the financial crisis and the ability of banks and central banks and doing all this and that everything should be decentralized, everything should be anonymous. And, you know, I had mentioned, you know, I'd grown up through the internet. You know, the internet was designed to be a decentralized network. And it was gonna be, you know, anybody could be anything on the internet you didn't have to identify yourself. You didn't have, you could find anything there. Ultimately, we want some governance and some level of trust. And regulators want a certain throat to choke when something goes wrong. And that is really what makes an ecosystem real. And that's where we're going. That's why we were able to have that one and a half trillion dollar increase in the last three years is because this part of the ecosystem is not that pure vision of Bitcoin and the pure vision of blockchain. And you know, for me, I'm agnostic. I just wanna know where, where the value is going up and where the value is going down. I don't really care whether it's decentralized, semi-centralized or whatever, but definitely the pure vision it's certainly not hurting at a trillion dollars of value in 10 years. But I think if I was going to look at the next $30 trillion for this ecosystem, I would look at the semi-decentralized part. Okay, you know, I guess I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to stop. So because we have many, many questions from the audience. So let me hand it off to Melina. Thank you so much. This is really fascinating. And let's just go to some of the audience Q&A so you can A, their cues. Thank So I'm going to hand it off. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, Alkesh. There are a lot of questions. And so everyone, please forgive me if we don't get through all of them this evening. I'm going to kind of go from start to finish. Um, you know, one of the earlier questions um, has to do with how demand will be driven by institutional investors. You know, you just mentioned that you started coverage seven weeks ago. You know, we're talking about a massive institution. Um, so what do you see in terms of drivers for the institutional investment side into these asset into this asset class? Sure. So I, I think there's um, I mean, there's a few drivers, right? There's one driver is um, client interest. <laughs> you know, uh, seeing three trillion dollars of value be created. I think clients of institutions across the board are saying, hey, how do I get involved in this? That in, you know, applies to incumbent banks, it applies to mutual funds, it applies to hedge funds. Um, you know, I'd mentioned that you know, board members had better be asking their corporate management teams, what's the strategy? Do, again, and I'm not saying that you know, they should do anything with it, but they have to have a strategy or at least they have to have a view. And so that, you know, seeing all of that asset creation, asset value creation, I, I think is a significant driver. The second one though, and what's held, I think, banks and most of the institutional world back is the lack of regulation. You know, all of this took people by surprise, right? You know, Bitcoin's been around for a decade, but 
you know, Bitcoin really wasn't doing anything to hurt anybody. You know, it was around, the central banks couldn't care in any real way. Uh, and so, yeah, they knew it was there. And that's why they start, started pet digital currency projects, but they weren't really afraid of Bitcoin. <coughs> but now with these new ecosystems being created, with financial applications being created, where, you know, they're offering interest of 5%, 7%, where people are investing in some of these things without knowing the risks, with no consumer protection, where some of these coin offerings look a lot like an initial public offering, but without all of the disclosure and regulatory filings, that's attracted a lot of attention. And I think as the regulatory framework gets created, you're gonna see the large institutions really wanna enter this space and, and they will. And you know, you're already starting to see the little steps that they're taking to do that. But nobody wants to, you know, if you're a large trusted bank, the last thing you want to do is offer a service or do something and then have a regulator say it's illegal. Even if it wasn't illegal when you, you, know, you were doing it and you stop immediately, it's, it's still horrible, <laughs> right? And so that's the second reason. And then the third is really, companies actually should start using digital assets. And I think as that becomes clear, you know, I gave the Microsoft supply chain example of saving tens of millions of dollars. You know, a real expensive service that uh, companies do is give dividends, right? It's a very manual process of actually setting up the dividend and so on. You could tokenize securities and you could have a smart contract that pays the dividend. You could potentially save $6 billion a year um, across the board. Um, by tokenizing dividends. So the back office capabilities of really saving money and are amazing. So I think those are the three big drivers. Okay. Thank you. Um, staying a little bit macro, what is your perspective on the fact that this boom has occurred post recession, post financial crisis, um, in, in the backdrop of a super easing monetary policy and, you know, zero interest rates. So, yeah. yeah, so I, so there's two parts to that. One, having a lot of excess money <laughs> sloshing around the system certainly inflates most risk assets, right? You could say the same thing for high multiple stocks. You could say, you know, it's one of the reasons why the debt markets have stayed inflated. And it's certainly today, this asset class is a supply demand asset class, right? There's very little ability, or at least the tokens, to be valued from an intrinsic value basis, even though there's transaction fees. There's actual value that these tokens have because of the transaction fee. That's where Charlie was wrong, but he didn't know they had transaction fees. So that's okay. So, um, by the way, when I uh, was an analyst covering tech at Morgan during the internet, uh, Warren Buffett actually responded to a few of my reports back then too. So at least, you know, I, I've had some connection there. Um, but if you have a fee schedule and cash flow, you have value. But we don't know what that intrinsic value is. So absolutely, if risk assets broadly decline, this sector will decline as well. But what we're trying to do is create an investment framework around it so we can figure out at least today what the relative valuations of these should be based on developer activity, user adoption, and transaction fee consistency, right? If we can get those three metrics, and that's where our research is very focused, we can at least figure out which of the companies, if, you know, if the entire market went down, I mean, the stock market went down 20% um, because suddenly, you know, the Fed tapered faster, raised interest rates faster, <clears throat> money flew out of risk assets, I'm not quite sure where it would go, um, then you know this area would get hit as well. Okay, that makes sense. Um, okay, so another question in terms of the technology, what are your, what are your thoughts on blockchain um, adoption at a larger scale in terms of efficiency? Yep, so, so blockchain has a trade-off in that, you know, blockchain is very secure and it's secure because it can be distributed very broadly. So there's, you know, very little control 
over what transactions are actually posted. Uh, but then it's slow, right? If, you're, if you have to write to 10 million hard drives <laughs> for where the blockchain is kept, that's not a really fast piece, right? You know, you think about Visa does 1,700 transactions per second. You think about, you know, B of A, we do a million trades per second, right? Because we have derivatives and so on. Mm -hmm. So you really can't do it on the blockchain as it was initially created. There are variations of the blockchain where you can actually do off blockchain transactions and then post them to the blockchain. Those are, you know, potentially blockchain 1.5 versus blockchain 1.0. And then there's use cases where you don't have to have 10 million copies of the blockchain. As I'd mentioned with the Microsoft supply chain, you only needed eight nodes. There might've been a few more nodes at each of those, but you probably only had 24 ledgers. 24 ledgers you can write to very fast and is really you know, easy to do. And so I, my sense is, is you know, Bitcoin is the big 10 million node blockchain, 100 million block, you know, I, I have no idea where it's gonna scale up to, but nobody really expects Bitcoin to be fast with transactions. But the ecosystems, and this is why we're also keeping track of transaction velocity and volume on Ether, on Cardano, on Solana, is that the transaction velocity has to be fast enough that people are gonna use those applications. And that likely means much smaller, less distributed blockchains and that's what I meant by a semi-decentralized network, as opposed to the pure vision of a completely decentralized network. Yeah, okay. So um, let's see. I mean, I'll put it out there because I'm sure everybody's also wondering the same question, but as retail investors, you know, individual retail investors, you know, referencing um, a slide earlier in your presentation with the different baskets and in, in terms of the ecosystem, you know, there are um, crypto ETFs coming out, but where as a retail investor, can you focus your money and your energy in terms of having access to these types of investments that are grouped, you know, if you want exposure to, to specific areas of the ecosystem? Yep. So I, I think there's, you know, three ways that really people can invest in, you know, this area, uh, at least today, there will probably be many more. And, and I don't specifically, I won't talk about futures products and spot products and those things, but really you can either just go out right and buy tokens, right? You know, you can, <clears throat> get a PayPal account, or most, most people have a PayPal account, say I want $100 of whatever token they're offering and you're in this world. And um, we don't make any token recommendations. The only thing I would suggest is that uh, don't just bet on one. <laughs> and you know, look for ones that have ecosystems being built on them because those uh, that at least has a chance of being one of the ultimate winners. So you can outright buy tokens, you can go, if you want a whole variety of tokens, you'd go to Coinbase, which is public, uh, and you can get a whole variety of tokens and you can get some financial services, new decentralized financial services that way too. And you know, so that's an interesting way and that's the token piece. The second way is something where I, I'm fortunate that I have you know, um, the number one um, research department on Wall Street to work with. So, you know, we're II number one and uh, they, um, all of the analysts cover all these different industries. And so what I did was I went to the analysts and I said, okay, I know it's really early innings. And I know that digital assets, blockchain is really a small part of, if it's a part of any of your company's revenue. Uh, what, which companies do you cover that as digital assets get more adoption, your company will benefit with true market cap appreciation. And so we create a list of 43 companies mm. that would do that. So, you know, you can imagine, um, you know, what some of them are. Signature Bank was one of the ones we listed. Uh, we listed Square, you know, we listed, uh, uh, so a number of names. And so that was really valuable that I was able to leverage 
our research department and our analysts real understanding of where there could be market cap value. Now the third is uh, more of, you gotta wait a little bit, not a long time, but wait a little bit. You know, there's been 20, $25 billion of VC money that's come into this sector this year, up from three last year. It's gonna be more next year, right? Andreessen Horowitz just raised $2.3 billion VC fund a few months ago. Paradigm just raised $2.5 billion last month. That money's going somewhere. Um, private companies uh, in this space that are likely to exit somehow, maybe they get bought, but their value in aggregate is around $300 billion, which means that's real investable when it comes public. And so those companies are gonna be showing up. And again, you know, you have to be careful because it's early. Some of them are not gonna make it, uh, but there's, you know, there are gonna be the companies that are actually the picks and axes of this system. They're gonna be the companies that actually are going to potentially be the Amazons of this ecosystem. And they're, they're not at the you know, starting line yet, but they're very close. Interesting, thank you. So related to market cap appreciation and looking at companies that will benefit from this, um, the increase in the underlying asset prices, one of the question is related to how, how do you understand the valuation of the underlying tokens or networks or protocols versus the actual entity or organization that's creating them? And yep. where is, you know, what's the relationship, if any, in terms of, you know, market cap versus the underlying, you know, token or security? Yeah, so to me, um, you know, the ultimate valuation framework always has to come back to cash flow eventually, right? I mean, in the end, um, even if there's no cash flow immediately. So for example, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to meet Jeff Bezos back in 97 um, when, you know, we were shooting for his IPO. Uh, and, um, you know, I bought completely into his story after having lunch with him. I just, I became a true believer. And that was at a time when they were so cash flow negative, right? Just cash flow negative, but, and, you know, losing money. But what our analyst was able to do was say, look, this is all discretionary spending, spending on CapEx, which now has ultimately become AWS and, you know, really driving the cloud and all that stuff. And if they stopped all discretionary spending, they could have $10 in earnings. You know, this is in the early 2000s. $10 in earnings at whatever multiple, the stock was undervalued by 50% at the time. And that's why, you know, you saw one of the biggest value investors in the world at Lake Mason, Bill Miller, make it his biggest position. And so that's really how you have to think about the tokens and the companies is you have to follow the cash. And so today, the tokens that have no transaction fees, they're not going to ever have intrinsic value. If they have no intrinsic value. There's no way I'll ever be able to value them. Then it's a supply demand game. And, you know, for example, with Bitcoin, if you ask me what's going to happen with Bitcoin, you know, supply is around 19 million, maybe going to 21. Demand seems to be rising. I think it goes higher. Do I have a target price? Not a chance, because I have no clue. But the tokens that have transaction fees that are rising because of the ecosystems being built on, their value is rising. I just don't know what that base value is yet until the ecosystem matures. And the companies, if they're somehow making money off of that token through cash coming in, we can then do intrinsic value from there as well. And that's the investment framework I put around it. Even if they're making intrinsic value based on supply demand, no, no, no. <laughs> and on, on on this on the token. Oh, oh yeah, sure. Right? I mean, it, it, it's, I it's mean, an interesting. Look, look at uh, look at an auction house, right? Yeah. Look at Sotheby's or those. I mean, their whole business is supply demand. True. And we still give them value. Mm -hmm. True. Um, there were a couple of questions regarding any sort of great information resources for all of us to keep up with what's going on in the meta universe. <laughs> um, one specific question was about, was related to any books or any published frameworks to actually um, perform deeper valuations for bankers, people in financial services to perform valuations on crypto company, uh, you know, 
publicly traded crypto um, companies and firms, and and then more generally, what information resources are out there. You know, we're not subscribing to B of A research, but <laughs> you know, you know, well, you know that really wanted, well, you know that's going to be my answer. But um, yeah. no, know. people are really interested, and I and I think you know, I think everyone is is excited to keep learning and keep yeah. staying in in concert with the developments that are rapid and and changing over time. So I, I can't make any recommendations from that perspective, but uh, first on the investment framework, there it doesn't exist. It's actually a real window for us. Mm-hmm. Is that is what we're creating, and you know everybody on this call just got a preview. <laughs> uh, Look at developer activity, transaction velocity, volume, and then trying to measure transaction fees, because ultimately that is going to be the only investment framework that really works, in my view. Okay. I think you know there's. Um, a view that there's a lot of information on Twitter and in the Twitterverse for this sector. Um, I think you have to be very careful. It reminds me of, you know, the bulletin boards of 20 years ago where uh, you have 1% or 5% of valuable information and then you have a lot of noise. And so you have to be really careful with all the Twitter, with all the tweets. Although I do follow them because I wanna know what people are saying and thinking. And it's, it's interesting. Um, and you also have to be careful about all the YouTube videos. There's so many YouTube videos because anybody can post, right? And when I started looking at this space years ago and I've watched the world of YouTube of crypto grow, there's actually, things are just flat out wrong, <laughs> but there's nobody actually policing it, right? So. You know, I think if you really want to understand the technology and how it affects the finance world, watch Gary Gensler's lectures. Okay. You know, he um, he obviously gets it. He knows that you know some of the stuff that's going on really is a security offering <laughs> that should be regulated, and he understands what Bitcoin is. He understands what blockchain is. Um, those lectures are really interesting. I think you know. I've read a number of textbooks on this space and I've read, you know, a bunch of textbooks since I started doing it. Don't do that. <laughs> you know, I mean, go ahead and skim a textbook, but if you start a textbook without a real love of software and engineering and math, you'll just get frustrated. So, you know, I, I think watch the lectures, get one textbook if, you know, you want. And, uh, and I don't really have a preference for any specific textbook. There's, there's a lot of good ones, um, you know, uh, from all sorts of schools, including Columbia. Uh, but, you know, Ether was, star- uh, sorry, uh, you know, a, a new token called Avalanche was, caught, was started, you know, from my other alma mater, Cornell, uh, and, you know, Cornell professor. And, you know, there's some good work out of there. So th- there is good work out there. But because it's so easy and there's just so many people engaged in the sector and so many people have made money in this sector just by holding this stuff. And they didn't realize why they were buying it, but they made a lot of money that they feel like they didn't need to share. And what they're sharing may not be the most productive way for people who are not involved to actually get involved. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, a few more questions, and then Harry, I'll have you ask some questions as well, if they're still on your mind. Um, a question about the fund flows. So what, in terms of net fund, fund flows coming into crypto versus the market cap of $3 trillion, um, is this a sustainable ratio or are we overextended in terms of the percentage of fund flows moving into this asset class? Yeah, so <clears throat> again, there's probably two parts to that answer. One... This is a risk asset that um, I, I think you know will continue to benefit by low interest rates and easy money, which really you know isn't going away anytime soon, right? Even with the Fed potentially starting tapering a little bit more, there's really no sign that interest in, you know rate increases are happening much faster than we expected over the next few years. So you know from that perspective, I would expect fund flows to continue to come in. Um, the second part of it, though, is I think over time, the fund flows will become more discerning. And you're already starting to see that decoupling, you know, where people are saying that Bitcoin isn't appreciating as much as the alternative coins. 
And even CNBC's figured that out, right? Is that, you know, Ether seems to be gaining value faster than Bitcoin. And so, you know, I do think that you're going to see fund flows shift. And I think you're going to see the fund flows that are going into just the fund tokens that have no intrinsic value, no ecosystem being built. You know, after a while, people will get tired and bored of those, right? I mean, they may still buy them for fun. You know, uh, as I said, there will be an Alkesh coin. Please feel free to buy. Uh, but, you know, the amount of money coming into those type of tokens is probably going to not be as strong. On the other hand, the, some tokens are building communities, right? You're seeing now tokens for, um, you know, for artists, for um, musicians, and people are buying that as a badge of their loyalty, fan loyalty. And so this asset class is growing in so many different applications that I think you'll see fund flows become discerning, but aggregate fund flows will continue to rise. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. I'm taking lots of notes. <laughs> <laughs> so forgive my lag. <laughs> Harry, are there any questions that you'd like to bring up? Um, so I think we should, I, I think Alakesh has been talking. It's a certain, I know it's exhausting to do this on his side of it because it's just a lot of <laughs> thinking. Um, but I, I have one, one last question, which you mentioned, and you mentioned Gary Gensler. Like, so what about regulation in this space? Like you, you mentioned regulation as the driver of growth at, at the same time some people would say like the the whole reason is because people can do things that you cannot do if it was regulated so like how, how did what's the trade-off with regulation can you just talk for yep. a minute or two sure so i think short-term regulation is certainly a risk and it's a risk because <clears throat> you have right now um it is the wild west and that was you know one of the parts uh one of the subtitles of my report is uh, it's the Wild West, and the report we wrote two weeks ago was Law and Order is coming to the Wild West. So, you know, there's obviously going to be much higher administrative costs. There's going to be more disclosures. If people with that house wallets certainly are regulated as banks, that's going to change the way they do business. It's probably going to cut into margins. There's a lot of short term impact from regulators. On the other hand, the longer term impact is what I was saying before, is that suddenly you're going to see the banks, the mutual funds, the hedge funds come into this space because they'll be able to trust a framework for them to actually do business in it. And, you know, trading digital assets is important because clients want it. They want to be able to buy these pieces and they want counterparties that they trust as well. They don't want to, you're not going to see very large mutual funds, institutions, go on to a decentralized exchange where they don't know who's on the other side of a trade. And so, and they can't, for their fiduciary duty of the investors in their funds, they can't be just trading with anonymous. Maybe in a hundred years, the rules will change and they'll be able to, but in the regulatory framework that's not changing, if we can get rules around these assets, you're gonna see all the banks be trading these things <coughs> and offering these services. And that's really cool, right? Is that if you can start tokenizing a security issuance, you're now able to give it to many more people because you're really using the internet. If you're able to, for example, tokenize. So let me give you an example. If we were creating Uber today, we could create an NFT. We could then have, you know, Uber, the Uber app, uh, the Uber company, obviously, you know, a really cool company, great network effect, uh, massive scale. But again, if we were just creating it today, NFT, we figure out the six main things the dispatcher does as a service. We create six smart contracts. We could create the Uber app as it existed when it first came out, probably within 90 days. But the difference is instead of, the Uber app being owned by Uber, the company. This app or this NFT, we could do a distributed coin offering. So the drivers own the app and users own the app. And the more you use the app, the more coins you get, 
or the more value it increases because there's a little transaction fee that gets collected each time. And that's really the promise of the bit of digital assets and the blockchain. It's not that you could stay anonymous and do illegal things and blah, blah, blah. It's that you're actually changing ownership from you know, one guy who owns all of Facebook to all of the people who are actually creating that content, using that content, and giving it to them through the use of digital assets and tokens. And that's what that regulatory framework needs to be in place with consumer protection so people understand what they're doing, so they feel safe doing that. All right. Um, well, that's great. Thank you. Okay. So I, I think, um, you know, uh, we have more questions coming in, but I think it's fair at this point to just call it a day. And, and thank you so much for your time. Um, and thanks for having I mean, me. It's, it's been really, really very fascinating. And uh, thank you so much for, for being here and sharing your thoughts on this space. Great. Thank, thanks very much for inviting me. Thank you, Alkesh. And I just wanted to mention a few people in the chat are asking about a Columbia Business School alumni network to get together and share information and chat. So Harry and I will take that back to heart and figure out with uh, alumni relations the best uh, method of, you know, whether it's LinkedIn, whether it's a proprietary like Columbia app that we have. Um, but I just wanted everyone to know that we're not ignoring your question on that. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, we'll 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 work on it. We'll we'll, we'll build an uh, an NFT to allow people to chat to do it. Right. Exactly, and then everybody can participate. Yep. Excellent. All right. Thank right. you. Thanks, Thanks everyone for attending. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Alkesh. Bye.